Well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We are starting the book of Galatians today, which I'm very excited about. I am too. Yeah. I am too. It's a beast of a book, even though it's small. There's a lot going on. Man, I don't know if I've studied more for an episode of this podcast. Get ready, everybody. Then for <laughs> for the book of Galatians, and yet still feel like I'm only like scratching the surface. Yeah. And why why is that? What's going on in Galatians that has you in such a tizzy, Seth? Uh so I mean depending on how in tune with the theological debates people might be, it's like the issue at hand is like, how does the Old Testament and the New Testament interact with each other? Well, that's a big question. What yep. does the Old Testament laws mean for a Christian today? Mm. Should we follow them or should we not? And if we don't follow them, does that mean we're just abandoning what God said was good and right a couple thousand years ago? Does that imply God changes? And then add on top of that, the fact that nobody seems to agree what Paul is saying in the book of Galatians um, adds to that layer of complexity uh, or and also who is he speaking against? And what's the hair? Like everything is debated and everything's debated on a topic that holds a whole bunch of weight for Christian, which yeah. is what do we do with the Old Testament now that Jesus has come? Yeah. So like, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Seth's mind, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> but I like, I like that last thing you said, which is what do Christians do with the Old Testament now that Jesus has come? Yeah. That's a good question. That's yes. And is that on the line in Galatians you feel like? Yes, most okay. certainly. So why? What's going on in Galatians that has put that on the line for us? What's funny is that Paul, being Paul, writing a letter, we only get half the conversation, right. obviously. <laughs> uh, and so what's happening is that Paul's writing a letter to a group of believers in a place called Galatia, mm-hmm. which is a province in Asia Minor. Galatia? Galatia. <laughs> Galatia. Gala. Galatia, Galatia. Uh, pronunciation Galatia. joke <laughs> for those who like to laugh at those. I like them. <laughs> you like them. Um, and there are a group of teachers who have come into this church and, as Paul says, preaching a different gospel. And so this letter does a couple things. Mm. One, it proves the truth of his gospel. And two, he spends a ton of his letter just proving that his gospel hasn't been modified by public opinion. So apparently these false teachers are coming in preaching a different gospel and saying the only reason Paul's preaching to you what he's preaching is because he's scared of offending you. And so he's giving you a soft-shoed version Mm. of biblical truth. And so we're giving you the real thing. Paul's giving you the softened thing. I see. So Galatians, the letter of Galatians comes in and Paul says, no, I've been preaching the same thing since day one. Uh And two, you're wrong for all these reasons. Okay. So if that's what's happening, what was the gospel that Paul had been preaching faithfully all along? Yeah. And what was this more rigorous biblical version that his opponents were teaching? That's that's right. So that's that's the big question question? (laughs) of Galatians is like, and like not, not a ton of people agree precisely on the contours okay. of all of this. Sure, but talk big picture. Talk big picture. I yeah. mean, one way to talk about the gospel is the way that Paul does in chapter 1, verse 4. Okay. Uh, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. Hmm. That's the gospel. Okay, And yeah. he says it right at the outset, that Jesus Christ has died for our sins in order to take us from an old age and bring us into a new age. Hmm. So that's one way to talk about the gospel, according to Paul. Okay. Uh, But um, the more broader picture of what's happening in these letters is that we become a member of God's family and become part of God's kingdom, not through certain actions taken by the Jewish people like circumcision mm-hmm. or keeping kosher or observing the Sabbath, but by trusting Jesus alone. Mm. The way that we're identified as part of God's kingdom in God's age is by our trust in Jesus, not by certain ethnic markers of Jewish identity. And that is also his gospel, is that trust in Jesus is the only thing we need in order to be saved from our sins in order to be a member of God's kingdom in yeah. order to be a part of God's covenant family. So Paul, in in the side of the conversation that we can hear in Galatians, mm-hmm. he's he's saying that faith in Jesus alone is what saves you. Mm-hmm. And uh, is this the letter where he says like neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything? Or is that that's right. Okay, that's that is right. this letter. Okay, 
Well, and this goes back to like, well, what do you mean by safe? Okay. So because yeah. that's kind of the central issue in the book of Galatia. Oh, okay. It's like, well, it, it's central to how we understand what the problem is in Galatia. So it's kind of hard to know even where to start. Do we start with Paul's declaration of the gospel or the problem according to these Galatian heretics? Right. Because what's at issue in Galatia? Is it a different understanding of how we are saved, mm -hmm. how we are made right with God, how we become part of the heavenly kingdom? Or is it about how we best respond to the fact that God has made us part of his kingdom? Oh, I see. Is and, it, yeah, is it, is, it, is it the mechanics of how we go about entering God's family? That's right. Or is it what do we look like once we become part of God's family? That's exactly right. I see. Okay. And so people disagree about that very basic thing. I see. Uh, and maybe it's now the best time to say, like, here are the options. Maybe. I think we can, like, put that down okay. for a second and go, I still I still want to understand yes. what, I, I think I have a little bit of a picture without getting into the details of what Paul was saying. Okay. He's saying... Faith in Jesus alone saves, not obedience to the Old Testament law. Yep. Which obviously I can immediately hear a thousand problems with saying it that way. Okay. Which is probably what the people right. in Galatia were struggling right. with. Yes, right. Uh, and but so I, I think I understand where Paul's coming from. He's always been teaching that faith in Jesus alone, not being circumcised, is, is what brings you into the, what, the kingdom. either brings you into God's family or is the best representative of what it looks like being in God's family. That's right. However you come down on that. So what were the other opponents saying? Like, what was their gospel? Yes. Because, I'm asking this, mm -hmm. because at the opening of his letter, yeah. Paul seems real mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He seems real, real mad. And, and I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Yeah. He calls them agitators. He calls them, uh, at one point he tells the people teaching in Galatia to go ahead and emasculate themselves, like, castrate themselves right. because they're demanding circumcision. Paul gets mad right. in Galatians. Yes. Yeah, and he's like, and I don't even care if an angel came down from heaven and preached you a gospel. If it's not what I've told you all along, it's let, not right. Let them be accursed. Uh, yeah, let, let them, them be them cursed. Be cursed. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a big deal. So it's deal. like, a lot's on the line for Paul here. So like, they had to have been saying something that was not good. That's right. It, it couldn't have been like, oh, he's just a little left to center. It's like, why is he so upset? What were they saying? Yeah. So well, let me just give you the options. Okay. One option is that they are functionally teaching some sort of like works righteousness. Okay. This group, this Gala these Galatian heretics, these cursed Galatians are coming in and they're saying the way that you enter into God's family and the way that you know you are a member of God's family is by doing certain actions. Okay. Once you get circumcised, once you... Um, change your diet. Change your diet. Once you consistently practice the Sabbath, right. this is what makes God approve of you, and this is what makes you an approved of member of God's kingdom. Okay. This is what it means to be accepted by God. Okay, that's one side. What's, so, yeah. what's the other version of what they might be saying? The other version of what the, they might be saying is... And the reason why this argument exists is like if that is what a form of legalism that these right. people are taught teaching and a lot, oftentimes these heretics are called judaizers because they want people to accept the jewish marks of identity right yep. judaizers right. is that the reason why people object to this understanding of the book is in part because that's just not the way judaism works that's not what the old testament teaches right is that you are saved by, by what works. you do right even if it is Jewish markers of identity, right? Throughout the whole Old Testament, the Bible is pretty consistent that you are saved by God's grace alone. Yeah. He saved Israel from Pharaoh before a they even law, had a law. Before they had a law, yeah. God saves by grace, and the Jewish markers of identity given at Mount Sinai are proclamations of faith. Right. They are identity markers for God's people. They're proof that you believe that God is the one who saves and the mm -hmm. one who has made you His people. They're what people who have been saved do, mm -hmm. but they don't make you members of God's family. Right. However, and this is where the teaching, so like that's a, a real, like a more coherent understanding of what Judaism teaches, yes. especially in the Old Testament. Right. And so what does that mean the law is? Mm -hmm. What does that mean the kosher commands and circumcision is all for then? Yeah. If it doesn't make you a member of God's family, what do they do? Well, what those laws were always meant to do is they were meant to, show people who are members of God's family how to behave 
and marked them as different right. from the rest of the world. This was how you knew who was a member of God's covenant community and who wasn't. Right. These people don't have two different kinds of fabric. These people yeah. only eat not pork. Right. Uh, <laughs> these people don't work on Saturday. And this yeah. is this makes them distinct and unique from the rest of the world. Right. And this is how God wants a distinct and unique people to behave. So, yes, Jesus has come. He's the Messiah the Old Testament has been uh, waiting for. Mm -hmm. But now that the Messiah has come, how do we remain distinct from the world? Right. We do what we've always done. Why would you abandon Why would all you of these abandon? things we've always done? And and the, they do the same thing they've always done. Right. And so, like, so, so are, from the what, world. You, what you're saying is like these Galatian anathema. Yes. <laughs> they've come in and they've, they're making this argument, which is pretty cohesive. Yeah, and I think so. They're, they're saying like, yeah, we believe in Jesus too. Mm. He's the promised Messiah that the whole Bible has been pointing to. But that doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we can just stop telling converts to not be circumcised or that's right that we that we don't that we can just eat whatever we want now that we right yeah this is how god's people are supposed to look god himself said so right right yeah so just why would because the messiah came doesn't mean all those laws changed that's right yeah and so even jesus himself said i've not come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law yeah and i mean if, to keep giving this idea as yeah. much weight as you can there's a whole bunch of verses in scripture that seem to indicate that Gentiles, non-Jews, will be invited into God's covenant community, and they too will be expected in the age to come to continue some Jewish rituals. Mm -hmm. In the book of Isaiah, um, chapter 56, I believe, we're told that Gentiles will come in and offer sacrifices. Zechariah 14, Gentiles will come into this new kingdom, and they will celebrate the Feast of Booths. Isaiah again says that eunuchs in the next mm -hmm. age will be expected to celebrate the sabbath right so the old testament seems to anticipate the yeah it's like okay all the all the gentiles are coming in now right because of jesus and let's keep fulfilling it you guys need to follow the laws that the prophet said you would right yeah. and so what paul's responding to is that idea mm. that now that jesus has come we still must separate ourselves from the gentile world mm -hmm. with jewish markers of identity how else will people know that we've gone from an old age to a new age yeah how do we know that we've left the world behind right. and we've entered into a new godly family you can probably tell by like our audience can probably tell by all the time we're spending on this this feels particularly compelling to us um, because I think it gives as much credit as I can to an idea. The idea yeah. that we are saved by our works is so alien to a Jewish mind right. that this feels like it makes sense of the Bible as I understand it yeah. and as Jews have understood it for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. So I have a lot of invested in this idea, but I'm also severely not convinced in many areas and find myself going back and forth. So, but like, I think that is generally what is on the line in the book of Galatians. And what's happening then, to just name the consequences of this idea, is this group of teachers have come in and they have started convincing people they need to be circumcised, that they can't eat with Gentiles, that they can only eat kosher. And their church, in some ways, is dividing into two groups again. Mm. You have a more Jewish-oriented church and a less Jewish-oriented church. And the one church that God has meant to come together in Jesus Christ is now looking a whole lot like the world mm. before Jesus Christ. Right. And Paul's coming and says, and this is anathema to the gospel. He's mm. saying, you're supposed to walk towards the gospel in which Jew and Gentile are brought together. Yeah. But by inserting these nationalistic or ethnic boundary markers, yeah. you're ripping apart what Christ has done. I see. The reason why you shouldn't be eating kosher or demanding that other people eat kosher or demanding that other people keep the Sabbath is because you're reinstating things that were meant to divide in an era that mm. where God has brought together. Yeah, I think that argument uh, would pro could probably fall apart pretty quickly if I was on the other side. Because I would just say, like, no, we're trying to be unified in how we eat, in mm -hmm. what we look like, in our right. practices. They're the ones who are separating themselves mm -hmm. from us and causing division by not accepting these markers. Yes. This is how we've always looked the same, been unified, mm -hmm. rallied together. So it's their fault <laughs> for, yes. for not doing it. So it's like, I think for Paul, there's probably, there's also more on the line than just like, you guys are causing division. Cut it out. Right. For him, and I know he talks about this a lot in Galatians. He points to the fact that they are missing out on the point of the law and the point of circumcision entirely. 
that they've tried to make these Jewish identity markers of circumcision, Sabbath, and diet something that they are not. Yes, that is the argument he develops throughout the book. Yeah. Is that, so that's the issue. And more than that, you're misunderstanding the purpose of the law right. in the first place. Yeah. The law wasn't, was never meant to create members of God's family or only to divide God's family from people that were not part of God's family. Right. The law was always symbolic in yeah. some sort of way. Yeah. It was symbolic of God's character. It was also symbolic of the kingdom God meant to create. And it was symbolic of Jesus Christ himself. Yeah. So when Jesus Christ himself comes, things change. They yeah. must change. Our relationship with the things that pointed to Jesus must also change. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's, if we can, would it be helpful for us to look at some of the core arguments that Paul makes against the Judaizers or the anathema or whatever we want to call them? Yes. Uh, the Galatian heretics. Yeah. Um, what are some of his main arguments that he makes against them? Well, the first like third of the book yeah. is him just proving that he's never preached anything else. Okay. Which is really fascinating, I think, from just like a polemical perspective or just... That we have in our Bible. Right. It is fascinating that we have in our Bible a really dense piece of theology, but the first third of it is just uh, Paul proving his receipts. Mm. Like, so like part of me wants to like dig in there. Like, well, why does Paul spend so much time right. proving his credentials? Yeah. Why does he? Because I think in early, earlier when we were setting up the episode, you said something about like, um, like people were claiming that the gospel was being changed in order to um, appease different audiences. And That's so right. Based on who you're around, especially if you're around a bunch mm -hmm. of Jews, you ch change the gospel around to make yeah. sure that it is appeasing your audience. Yes. And so is Paul's point here simply that people are doing that. I'm not. Let me prove it to you. Yeah, they're saying the reason you're fudging on these biblical commands, God said, get circumcised. God uh -huh. said, eat kosher. God said, don't eat on the Sabbath. The only reason you're fudging on those is because your ministry been ministry among Gentiles and oh, I see. Jews for so long. Right. So it's like you're just trying to be appealing. If you go into a Gentile audience and you're like, hey, everybody, you can be free from your sins. And they're like, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, Jesus died for your sins and he rose again. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Also, time to cut off part of your body. And they're like... Right. I'm out. I'm out. It's also, like, no bacon. I'm right, out. Right. Also, you can't work on Saturday. I'm out. Yeah. And it's like, so they 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 were claiming that you have been side skirting some of these issues just to gain more converts. I think that is part of what he. Okay. So he mentions. They say, "Am I seeking the approval of man?" Mm. In chapter one, so, and which then it must be something they've been accusing him of. Must be something accusing him of. And then at the very end of the book of Galatians, Paul will like turn that knife back around and say, "You're the ones who are." Mm. trying to please people. I've uh, That's not what I've been doing. I see. Uh, so anyway, he, yes, I think that's part of the critique of Paul is that he's giving a gospel that's just more culturally palatable mm. to Gentiles, to non-Jews, and that he's changed, in, in particular, he's changed his more hardcore and biblical position the longer he's spent among Gentiles. Okay. So Paul responds and says, no, that's not true. Right. And let me prove it to you. Right. Okay, so how does he go about proving that to the people? Is that important? Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, it takes a, a, bit, a, a <laughs> good bit of space in the book. The yeah. first thing he says is that Jesus appeared to me directly and told me this. Oh well, uh, all right. <laughs> so check and uh, mates. Right. It's like it's a pretty big moment. He's like, I didn't receive what I'm teaching mm -hmm. about faith alone being the way in which we are mm -hmm. identified as members of God's family. I yeah. didn't receive that from anybody. I got that from. From Jesus, right? That's who I got it from. Yeah, um, it is an amazing apologetic how, that he lays out here. Not just that the fact that his message hasn't changed, but also a, an apologetic for Christianity in general, where it's like Paul gets a message from Jesus, mm -hmm. starts preaching, and then a long time later runs into the rest of the disciples. And yes. they realize that they're preaching the same message. That's exactly right. But he heard it straight from Jesus. They heard it from Jesus too, but incarnate. Yes. And it's like, how did this Paul get that message if it wasn't for a risen Jesus? That's right. That's amazing. Yes. And that's what, exactly what he does. He's like, it was a, it was until three years later right. that I even met an apostle. Right. And we had nothing to disagree about then. <laughs> and then 11 years later, mm. I brought my ministry under formal review by a council at Jerusalem. And you know what they said then? They said nothing. They added nothing to my understanding of the gospel. They didn't demand the circumcision of my Greek ministry partner. And they saw in my ministry a parallel 
to what they were doing among the Jews. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, I'm the one who's been, I've been preaching a consistent yeah. gospel this whole time, that the way that we're identified as members of God's family is not through circumcision, but through faith in Jesus alone. And all the apostles agree with me. Mm. You're, you false teachers are inserting divisions where there are none. Yeah, I've been unified. You're divided. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And then he goes on to a long story about how he has been consistent on this issue, even when the apostles haven't been. Right, because Peter, he he was on on. I, I, I guess I guess he was Peter really ever on team no circumcision, or was he? Was he just converted onto team no circumcision? So I think what's happening. So what, what this, the the basic outlines of the story is that Peter uh, is ministering in uh, Antioch, yep. um, and Paul meets him there. And what he notices is that Peter um, is not eating with Gentiles anymore, oh, right. like he used to. He is now only eating with other Jews. And he's the one who had this big experience at the household of Cornelius. Yes. where he welcomed Gentiles That's right. into the family of God and then went and defended that idea in Jerusalem to the other disciples. Mm -hmm. So he was like one of the original proponents of so, let's bring the Gentiles in and now he's not eating with them. So Peter believes yeah. that faith in Jesus is the only thing that's needed uh, to unify God's family and to, to identify as a member of God's family. But he's been people pleasing. But he's been people pleasing. Oh, that stinks. A group uh, they call it from the delegation of James. Oh. These, Judaid oh, these the Judaizers. James. <laughs> uh, they come in and they find it objectionable mm -hmm. that Jewish believers would eat with Gentiles who are not willing to follow the biblical commands of kosher eating. Right. And so to be to please this right. group, he separates himself from them. I and see. what's crazy, this has been happening for long enough that many other members of his church in Antioch were, were doing so, including Barnabas, Paul's mm -hmm. protege. So oh. Peter has effectively divided the church in Antioch into a Jewish contingent and a Gentile contingency because of this because of fear of this particular group. so is it possible that some of these galatian heretics are kind of using peter as their example like their excuse oh. to teach this way they're like this is what peter's doing this is what Peter. they might be i, I mean, don't that, know that for sure so, but that, yeah it's interesting they might they, there could be a sense in which they, they have to have no, they have to know what's going on in order for paul to be referencing it here right and they so have some knowledge it of, must of be this. some like piece of ammunition in their belt yeah, or they are teaching about that story but only giving half of it right. to their audience yeah. right okay um, interesting but but paul on the other side of it is saying like i don't mind being offensive as long as it's true he's like i'm not gonna people please uh, right i'm gonna i'm gonna show you the truth regardless of which audience i'm with right and, and that's so never changed and so what paul does is he publicly confronts peter oh right. and the and the, and and his own protege and everybody else there oh, and he says boy. you're actually not walking towards the truth of the gospel hmm. that's how the way he phrase, phrases it which i think is a really fascinating way to say that you are not walking towards the truth of the gospel hmm. The gospel is that faith alone is what makes and identifies us with God's family. Yeah. And you are inserting into that pre-established unity by the gospel Jewish markers of identity, mm. eating kosher. Yeah. That is not walking towards the gospel. And so he's saying you need to stop that and walk towards the <sighs> unity Christ has purchased yeah. in himself. Bull. So the idea is yeah. exactly right. He's like, you, I'm the only one. Who are you going to trust to preach the gospel? Me. Right. I, a guy who flip-flops or the guy who's been consistent? It's like, I've been yeah. preaching this the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm just like, okay. Because I'm just like, you get a little sympathetic for these heretics. Mm -hmm. Because if Peter fell prey right. to this pressure yeah. and these ideas, it's like, no wonder you had all of these other people following suit. And why even today, there's so much division, even in the Christian church, mm -hmm. about what is our relationship to the Old Testament now that Jesus has come. That's right. It's like, what has changed? And it seems like Paul is saying, everything's changed. Yeah. <clears throat> but Peter and these people, uh, and some today, say nothing really has changed, or not everything has changed. 
Uh, yeah. And so, I mean, we we probably need to address this. Yeah. Uh, and either we can either we can think we can do that one or two ways. Okay. We can address that question of now that Jesus has come, how has our relationship changed with the Old Testament law? We can yeah. address that question one of two ways, which is. Let's just talk about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, or let's walk through Paul's arguments in yeah. Galatians. How I mean, wanna... I think the best place to start is Paul's arguments okay. because it's in – so one of the most famous passages in the book mm. of Galatians is where Paul says that we are justified by faith in Christ mm. um, and not by works of the law. It's like right. one of the most famous – lines yeah. in all the books uh book of galatians and it comes right after this story mm. where peter has functionally divided the church in antioch because of his willingness to please the jerusalem contingency the people from the delegation from james right and so this idea that god has created a new type of unity through christ rather than through a unity through something like circumcision overrides in some sense or is the fulfillment of and what now acts as what makes people a member of God's family. That's maybe a clumsy way to say it, but that's that's everything that's on the line as I we see. come towards justification by faith. Okay. Uh, maybe define the word justification <clears throat> there because in that definition, it made it, made it sound like justification is uh, inclusion in a family or something. Man, so again, the oh, most no, beta. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to step in it. <laughs> this, this line right here. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. Those three lines, justified, works of the law, through faith in Jesus Christ, are all heavily debated. <laughs> uh, and what each one of those things mean, means something different to a whole, to different sides of the argument. Okay. Uh, and you can mix and match your different definitions of each one of those three and things. And come out with, with like... 18 different versions of it's the metaverse of of, of like (laughs) option of like biblical interpretation okay wonderful uh so what does it mean to be justified so paul is confronting peter he's saying this is wrong this is not walking towards the gospel Mm -hmm. what is the gospel the gospel is that a person is not justified by works of the law but through faith in jesus christ Mm. okay in the context of the story that we've just heard yeah what is he really saying and one way to understand this is I'll just do it all together. Okay. We are not identified as a member of God's family through something like eating kosher, which is exactly the reason you're giving for separating from this group of people. Right. But through faith in Jesus Christ. Yep. Meaning anyone who p- professes faith in Jesus Christ should be eating together at the same table. No matter ta- what they're eating. No matter what they're eating. Right. If you're going to drink the body and blood of Jesus at the end of that meal, mm. you can eat whatever you want before that meal. Ooh. Ooh. That's like the, like that. that's the that, that's the that's the idea okay. of what justification means. Yep. The true marker of identity of God's people is faith in Jesus. Yeah. And that's what makes us or that's what identifies us as members of God's family. Okay. Okay. That's clear. It's super clear and yep. it makes a ton of sense considering the argument going forward. Okay. The other way to understand this is that justification never has this sense, this diction this sense this of identifying as, as identifying marker uh, of a, being part of a family the dictionary definition the semantic range the semantic range of the right. word justification does not include that i see so that's a problem for that side of the argument that's a problem for that side of the argument okay. what justification means dic- in the dictionary is being declared righteous declared mm-hmm. good declared positively moral by god right um So this kind of goes back to our other way of understanding what the book of Galatians is about. These people are teaching legalism. Mm. And Peter, believing God would like him more if he ate Jewish, decided to start eating Jewish again. And Paul is coming to him and saying, no, don't you remember, uh, Peter, that we are not made more acceptable to God by doing certain legal practices. We're not declared innocent, moral, righteous by God, but simply by faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. The only qualification you need to be, by, to be called right in God's eyes is faith in Jesus. Yeah. Both sides make a ton of sense. Both sides make a ton and of sense. And I think like <laughs> it seems like an invisible line that doesn't need to be drawn because it's like, let's ask the question from something that I think everybody can agree with, mm-hmm. right? We have to believe in like that Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, yeah. In order to be a Christian. Okay? Yep. All right. Do I believe in Jesus, that Jesus rose from the dead in order to become a Christian? 
or is that what I do now that I am a Christian? It, it's both. Yes, yes, yes. And it's like, so it just sounds like what you're saying is like, it, do you have to follow the Jewish identity markers like circumcision and eating kosher in order to be accepted in God's family? Or is that what you do once you're a part of God's family? It's like, they're two yeah. sides of the same coin, it sounds like. Yeah, and I, yeah, and yeah. I understand the need for emphasis on either one uh, as we get mm -hmm. into like good exegesis and, right. and, and historical understanding. But it seems like there doesn't need to be as big of a divide between those two. And I think we can move forward with I think, those things in our head. Yeah, the, the big thing to take away is that there is a unity provided to God's people by faith in Jesus alone. Yeah. And that unity is being threatened by whatever these Galatian heretics are teaching. And Paul's saying, you've got to cut it out. Yeah. The gospel of Jesus Christ has unified God's people. And what you are believing is dividing God's people. Mm -hmm. And you could talk about legalism and Jewish markers of identity kind of in the same way in the sense. Right. It's like you can divide over Jewish markers of identity. There's a Jewish looking church and a non-Jewish looking church. Right. Jesus has done something that should abolish those distinctions and you need to stop it. Or true Christians uh, only wear headdresses. Right. True Christians don't wear headdresses anymore. And you've divided the church over something you believe gives you a better access to God. And Paul's saying, cut it out. Right. The thing that unifies God's people is faith in Jesus. Is faith in Jesus. That's good. Uh, so that's that's the the core of the argument. We can and we can move forward from there. Okay, cool. So we've we've talked about Paul's defense of himself and his consistent ministry. We've talked about his synopsis of the gospel, that it's yeah. faith in Jesus that justifies us, not works of the law. Now he kind of does go into some arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, what are those? So um, the first argument's really interesting. It's just an argument from experience. Okay. So he's trying to prove the truth that we are included in God's family apart from being circumcised or eating kosher. And the first thing he mentions uh, to the Galatians is the fact that one, they saw Jesus rise from the dead with their own eyes. Yeah. And they didn't, and they received that good news mm -hmm. and they received the Holy Spirit after that fact, all before any of them were circumcised. Yeah. And they're even experienced some miracles, presumably. Right. Like, so, like, they have had a profound experience with the risen Jesus mm -hmm. and his indwelling spirit. And that was before any of them knew they were supposed to eat kosher circumcise themselves mm. or anything else like the reason they should know that they are justified made a member of god's family by faith alone is because that's all they needed to yeah. experience the holy spirit already man that's a killer argument <laughs> but also can i just lean in there for like us and our audience sure because that's very encouraging please to me. please because it's just like that's just good news because i think i often forget like i remember when i came to jesus for the first time i was a mess yeah. I was an absolute mess. You were. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even know me back then. <laughs> but I was. And um, I just came to him in need. I had nothing to offer. Like, my life was a wreck. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, yeah, I just, I, I wasn't good. I was, right. I had, my life was full of sin. Like, I wasn't sanctified. Yeah. I didn't have holy aspirations. Yeah. But you, I just came to him in need. And yet, now it's so easy for me to think that I'm not right with God some days because I'm just not as holy as I know I should be. Or, yeah. and I'm like, man, who were you when you first came to Jesus? And he accepted you and filled you with his Holy Spirit and started guiding your life. And you right. saw miracles. Like, yeah. was it, was that, was that because of you and things you did? No. Yeah. It was just because God's a God of grace. And it, it was faith alone in it was, Jesus. It was faith alone in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Think back to to the way that Paul kind of summarizes the gospel, like Jesus saved us from our sins and um, he brought, brought us into... Uh, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. Yeah. Um, and they're like, there's a certain um, like helplessness and powerlessness when you talk about ages like that. It's like, right. I lived... Dur Me, myself, there was an age in which I was awful. Right. I was far from God. I was all these things. He says otherwise... Uh, elsewhere, he defines this evil age as immoral, impure, sensuous, idolatrous, sorceress, full of enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Like this. That's the age. That's the age. It'd be like, I, I, I lived during the Black Plague. Yeah. Like, there's just the, yeah. this intensity, this helplessness, mm. and that's where we were saved from. Right. It, you didn't 
earn your way out of that, right? right? Like you didn't yep. act your way out of that. You were plucked out of it, transferred out of it, yeah. saved from it. Yeah. Um, and yes, that's the, the way salvation works right. in the Bible. It's yeah. not by us circumcising our way out of orgies, but by like... <laughs> like right. Yeah. And then I love what he says too in, uh, I think it's Galatians 3, 2, where he says, having begun by the Spirit, are you now trying to be completed by the flesh? Yes. Like, are you try like the Holy Spirit started this work? Are you now trying to finish it of by your own yeah power? So something really great happened when He transferred you out of that realm. Yeah, and you think you can improve on the work of the Spirit right. by keeping the Sabbath? Yeah, no, you are transformed by faith, and you will continue by faith. Later on in the argument, we'll get there. He's like the only th circumcision is no uncircumcision doesn't count for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working itself out in love. Mm. Like that's the new definition of what it means yeah. to be a part of God's covenant family. I want to put a pin in this for everybody listening and watching that we are going to get into the question of what is the Old Testament law? Oh gosh. How yes. does it what does it have to do with us today? We're just, we're just working through the arguments that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. Paul is at. We'll we'll get some really firm answers on the ground, but yes. I just I don't want anybody to think we're side skirting the issue. We're going to get yeah. there. Yeah, okay. we're just going in at the pace that Paul does. That's right. <laughs> so the first one is an argument from experience. Okay, love that. Next. Uh, the next argument is he says, well, the whole Hebrew Bible agrees with my position. <laughs> uh, the Hebrew okay. Bible that you're saying that we must be more attentive to yeah. uh, and follow the laws that it describes. Well, all the whole Hebrew laws talks about the fact that we are made part of a God's family by faith alone, I see. apart from the work. That's interesting because that seems to be the exact argument that people who, who would be on the Galatian heretics side would say. It's like, just go read the Hebrew Bible. Right. It says be circumcised. It's a command. Yes. How can you argue with that? And he's yeah. like, actually, the whole Bible says don't be circumcised. Well, what the Bible says <laughs> is, uh, so he goes to Abraham, the first Jew. The first Jew, the, the guy who received the promise of circumcision itself. Right. Well, one, he was a Gentile. Right. He was Babylonian. He was Babylonian. Uh, and then how did he receive the promise? Uh, By faith. Oh, yeah. <laughs> By faith, God counted him as righteous. Yeah, because right. God gave him the promise that mm -hmm. through him all nations would be blessed. And he believed him. Yep. And it was credited to him as righteousness. He was justified yes. because he took God at his word. He had faith. That's right. Uh, yep. That's right. So he's like, so the patriarch agrees with me. Yep. That's how the Jews were created in the first place was through faith. Yep. So one point. Secondly, uh, not only do the patriarchs agree with me, the law itself agrees with me. Mm. The book of Deuteronomy, he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, oh. uh, and he, which includes all these debated identity markers that they're discussing in the book of Galatians. Uh, it says that no one who trusts those laws to become part of God's family um, will be able to because no one can keep those laws perfectly. Deuteronomy 27, mm. 26. The, the law itself admits that you can't follow these laws perfectly. Mm. And so if that's if, the hope. <laughs> if that's your hope, yeah. the law itself tells you that can't be bad hope. hope because yeah. it will ultimately fail you at uh, some point. You're like, the law says be circumcised, like do the Sabbath eat kosher and then you'll be okay. And it's like, actually it says you can never follow those laws perfectly. And so right. you need a different hope. Yeah. You need a different standard for what will include you in God's family mm. than just strict adherence to the law. And for Deuteronomy, that standard was the covenant, mm -hmm. which was God saying, I'll be your God. You'll mm -hmm. be my people. Yes. Yeah. Well, you trust God. Okay. Well, you trust that he will be your God. That's, yep. that's the point. And will you obey him? Will you obey him? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, then he says, okay, not only does Abraham, our first patriarch, the creator of the Jewish people, mm -hmm. was he justified by faith? Not only does the, the law, law say, say you need to be justified by faith. You need to be justified by faith because the law is not enough. The prophets also agree with me. Oh, boy. And he quotes from the book of Habakkuk, and he says, the righteous shall live by faith. Oh. Which is go. just a straight up quote right. from the book of Habakkuk. And isn't there, isn't there like a semantic word overlap with the righteous and being justified. Oh, yeah. So it's like the righteous will live by faith is almost another way of saying you're justified by faith. Yeah, I I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Hebrew and Greek both share roots 
uh, that we translate justice and righteousness. Yes, that's true. This is right. Uh, and so to, to, to have that word that says, you know, the righteous will live by faith mm-hmm. shares I a, a, a similar word that's like you're justified by faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like if you have saying. faith, you have done justice. Yes. So anyway, it's just interesting. The regardless of the semantic right. the details, the point is the same. The patriarchs, the law itself, and the prophets all agree that you are justified by faith apart from works of the law. Right. So so the whole Hebrew Bible was trying to get the people of Israel to see that they needed to have faith in something else mm-hmm. uh, other than like the the law itself or their own works or their own Jewish identity markers. Yes. Um, the, the ultimate way that you became a member of God's family, yeah. uh, the way that you like expressed your faithfulness to God's family uh, was through faith. That's the first way. The Faith most... in God. Faith in God. That's okay. Right. Yeah. And faith in God to do what or to well, be what? A or... faith that was demonstrated through certain actions. Okay. Right? Yep. That faith was demonstrated through circumcision. Yep. That faith was demonstrated through eating kosher. Mm. We believe in the promises of God. Therefore, we do not eat pork. We believe right. in the promises of God. So we follow the law. Right. That's why we follow the law mm-hmm. is because we believe this thing happened. But <laughs> this is where Paul's argument continues to okay. go okay. is that um, Jesus yeah. has fulfilled that law for us. Right. So this is where it gets even yes. more. It, right. gets, it gets deeper. Okay. Because circumcision, kosher laws, Sabbath weren't just ends in themselves. They mm-hmm. were pictures of something were pointing to something yes. they were acts of faith mm-hmm. because they they weren't having faith that circumcision will save me that's right they were having faith that god was doing something in the world they were having faith that god had called them his people right and and that all nations would be blessed that's right. through them that's right through some thing that he was going to do mm-hmm. and so they were participating putting like flesh on that faith yeah. By following those laws. That's right. Okay. Yes. So continue with Paul's arguments. Then. Yes. So then he moves oh, after saying, well, the whole Hebrew Bible talks about salvation by yep. faith. And then he says, now the laws themselves and the promises that the laws like that we are supposed to have faith in have also all been pointing in the same direction, hmm. which is, which is Jesus. Okay. And so he started, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, I didn't say that. So, so yeah, I was I, hinting at yeah, it. Yeah. You were hinting at it. Like that's, that's where it's going. And so he says, uh, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, the promises that the whole world would be blessed would be made to his offspring. But he didn't say offsprings. So he makes a grammatical point. <laughs> He's like, but did you notice? Which that gives all the Bible nerds out there so much grounding. So much joy. Like, we're allowed to be particular over plurals and singular. He says the Hebrew word isn't actually plural. <laughs> the Hebrew word is singular. It's I love, offspring I love singular, uh, which means Jesus. Right, because it wasn't oh, every seed that you've ever born, every offspring, every child that's ever been born in the Jewish nation he was saying that it was going to happen through one of your offspring, singular. Yes, Abraham would have a, a single yeah, offspring right. who would bless the entire world. Yep. And through faith in him is how he became part of God's covenant family. That's right. So when, when it says that Abraham was justified by faith, he was saying that he was believing God that one of his offspring would save the whole world. That's right. And so what he's saying is Abraham had faith in Jesus. Yeah. He didn't know his name. And that was 430 years before a law was ever written in Israel. Whoa. And so, yeah. yeah. So God's family yeah. was created and people were invited into it by faith in Jesus, not by circumcision or eating kosher. Right. Because, and then when, but circumcision was given to Abraham. That was. But not as a law, not as a law, but as a sign, as a sign. It was, it was, po- which means, and I think sign we can get all weird about. Let's mm-hmm. just say what a sign is. Signs point to things. Yep. If I'm driving to Orlando, I'm going to see a sign that says Disney World, 50 miles. It's pointing me to something. One of my, yes. favorite, one of my favorite things. And just to get really uh, graphic for a second. Oh boy. Uh, why, why circumcise the, why is circumcision on your reproductive organs? Right. Because the promise was given to an offspring. Right. So the reason why Hebrew men circumcised themselves was to remember and to like cut into their bodies a prophecy right. that 
a Jewish descendant would come and bless the entire world. Right. Every time you would circumcise a child, because uh, it was on the eighth day. Yeah. Right. Every time a Jewish male was circumcised, the idea that was to be communicated there was maybe this child will bear the Messiah. Yeah. Maybe this child will bear the offspring. Mm hmm You know? And like, yes. And you... Like that's the problem. It's an acted out prophecy. Like, right. I, and so, you know, I haven't thought about this before. This is totally off Galatians. Oh, okay. But it's interesting then that Jesus didn't have a biological father. Hmm. Right. Oh, right. It's almost as if to say God himself is right. always the one who had to be the Messiah. Yes. The, the circumcision was a Could si never have come from man. Right. Yeah. So like, oh, that's interesting. That is interesting. Anyway. Yeah. That's side cool. note. Well, good, good side note. That's good side note. That's good. Okay. Uh, and so then, um, when we say that Jesus has fulfilled circumcision, mm -hmm. we're saying that the sign to which, you know, the, the thing to which circumcision pointed mm -hmm. has now come. Mm -hmm. Jesus is here. The offspring has been born. Therefore, the sign is no longer necessary because it's not pointing to anything new. Right. He's come. That's why when I go to Disney World and I'm inside the Magic Kingdom, I'm not going to see the same sign that says, mm -hmm. you know, Disney World 50 miles. That yeah. wouldn't make any sense because I'm mm -hmm. there. I don't need the sign anymore, right? Because I'm I'm there. I'm You're, to the place that it pointed to. Yeah. And so I think that's Paul's point is that the the offspring has come. He's mm -hmm. here. So we don't need the sign anymore. Yes, that's 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 right. He, uh, <laughs> and in particular, he's he's saying that we no longer need it as a means by which to identify mm. who is part of God's oh, family. Right, because the way that's helpful. That's better because the way we identify as how we're part of God's family is the same way they did by faith by yeah. faith in Jesus. That's right. That's right. Right. And to reverse that in any way is to nullify the promise that made the Jewish people in the first place. That's right. If you start saying, well, no, no, it's doing a certain action is that what makes us part of God's family, then there never would have been a Jewish people. Mm -hmm. The Jewish people were created. God's people were created by faith, not by doing a certain action. Yeah. Okay. How else does Paul advance the argument? So what happens next is that Paul is fairly satisfied that he has proven. I mean, um, yeah, he's kind of painted him in the corner with the whole like 430 years thing. That, yeah, he's like he's proven that the Hebrew Bible teaches that we are made included in God's family, identifies part of God's family by faith, not by markers of ethnic inclusion yep. recorded in the law. So the obvious question is like, okay, then, okay, let's just assume the audience agrees with Paul. Okay, so we are justified by faith. Faith apart from the law. Why the heck do we have 613 laws right. and so much of our Old Testament telling us to do stuff oh if we're just going to abandon it all? Yep, here we go. <laughs> so that's the next we've, question. We've made, it to, we've made it to the rubber meets the road. <laughs> it, like, that's like the most important part of this conversation because yeah. if Paul is simply saying, well, the reason why we don't do it is because it doesn't matter anymore. What? Yeah, right. That feels like you're playing fast and loose with the Bible. So it absolutely how, does. And how, it seems like you're not taking Jesus at his word that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Right. So right. how do we make sense of the purpose of the Old Testament law and why it existed if the whole thing was like anticipatory and a sign mm. to Jesus? What do we do with it now that Jesus has come? Yeah. Well, I mean, we have to inhabit the rest of Paul's argument to begin to answer that question, right? Like we have to... Assume that he's right, that the bulk and the whole of the Hebrew scriptures is making a point, and that is that we are not saved by, by works, but we are saved by faith, that we are included in God's people by faith. And so like, it can't be that the law was there to show us how to be saved. Like he's right. disproved that. Mm -hmm. So like, if that's in your mind... Right. We can put that one aside. Yep. So it, we're not saved by the law. So they're not they're not there to help us understand how to be right with God. Right. But to the Galatians mm -hmm. point, does, doesn't the law reveal what God is like mm. in good expectations for his people? Isn't the law full of just commands about how to order society and to treat your family? Right. Why would we abandon Something that's clearly good, which yep. Paul will say later. The law is good. Yep. Uh, so what do we do with them if it's good? Yeah. Um, and that's probably the question we'll answer next week. Oh.
We, we punted. We're going to punt. Oh, cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, man. But before we... Why is it good news what we have so far is, yeah. the, is the question. Okay, with what we've uncovered so far, how is all of that good news? That's what we want to ask. Yes. I mean, let's just, let's just go for it because there's probably a bunch. I mean, the first one that comes to my mind is it's such good news that God has been promising and pointing to a Savior that would save us through faith alone mm-hmm. from the beginning. Yeah. Like, that's always been his plan that he would save us apart from ourselves that yes. he, all we have to do is just trust him yeah. and come to him as broken babylonians <laughs> and he will save us he'll save us i mean that is really good news that's yes. always been the good news and i think to play with this familial and national language that we've been using too is like he's not merely saving us as an individual entity to be in an individual relationship with him but he's saving us to be a part of a community and a family that he's building. Yeah, he, he made the promise to Abraham that he would have children and children and children, and these people, this family, would be his forever. Yeah. And so God is saving us into a loving family system built on the um, inclusion is, is not a strong enough word, mm. but like the lack of division and hostility Right, which is like what he's getting at. Like he's building a non-hostile family. Yeah, a new age. A new age in which we exist in peace forever. Like that is awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think the other thing I'm thinking about is I feel really personally like when I think about my my walk toward the gospel to use Mm -hmm. some of Paul's language is that like I just still don't look right. Okay. I don't have the Christian identity markers. Yeah. You know, like, sure, I still eat, I eat bacon. I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Like, and we'll talk about that <laughs> yeah. why. We'll yeah. talk about yeah. why that next week or in two weeks. Uh, but uh, I still am like, I just don't, I still don't look the part. Yeah. I still don't have the right markings of a Christian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I find the message of Galatians to be really good news because it reminds me that the only marker of identity I need is the fact that I do believe in Jesus. Yeah. And it's, it's the condemnation of Satan and my own broken conscience mm-hmm. that tells me otherwise. Yes. That, no, no, you're not good enough yet. Yeah. No, you need to add something to what Jesus has done. Yeah. And it's just not true that I look the part now. Yes. Only because I do actually believe that God became flesh, died for my sins, rose again is interceding for me at the right hand of God and is coming back for me again. And there's a whole community of people who believe that with you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they're just as broken. <laughs> and they're just and like and Paul is fighting to hold together yeah. broken people despite their differences. Yeah. Like right. It's like the, the the thrust of Galatians like keep your church pushed together. You are all broken people mm. saved by God. And the only thing you have in a world full of divisions is Jesus. Right. And you are all holding on to him together despite your Gentile and non-Jewish and Jewish backgrounds. Like right. there's a whole community of people holding on to nothing else but the fact that the Messiah Jesus has promised to rescue us from the evil of this age through himself. Right. And so we're just holding on to that rope because like, you know, it's <laughs> what like, else do we have? what else do we have? And like, we have a whole community of people doing that with us right. and fighting for the fact and that's what churches should be. They mm. should be fighting for the fact that there is no other boundary marker except our deep knowledge that Jesus will save us on his own. Mm. That's good news. It's good news. I, I want to talk about other things that are good news in Galatians, but I have to wait. You'll have to wait. I have to wait. <laughs> okay. All so, right. Next week, we'll talk about uh, why on earth do we have a whole book of laws Mm -hmm. if Paul just told us that they're not how we become good Christians. Yeah. I'm excited to talk about that. Yes. And a little nervous. Great. But good. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us uh, for our first talk in the book of Galatians. Well, just one more, you think? Just one more. All right. Well, we will see you in two weeks' time for our second little chat on the book of Galatians. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel creates short films, devotionals, and podcasts like this one. Everything we make is free because of generous supporters like you. To see our resources, visit SpokenGospel.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. See you next time.